Pray somebody need to hear that this morning. God does make a way. He made a way for Moses. He made a way for me. He's made a way for you. Well, we've been going through the Hall of Fame chapter, Hall of Faith chapter of the book of Hebrews. And today we're going to finish up chapter 11. So just buckle up and hold on. because There's quite a bit to get through a little bit here. Uh, but life within the family of God is marked by faith. That's how we're known. We're known by our love for Jesus Christ. We're known for our love for one another. And we're known by our faith. And we are defined by faith as a Christian congregation. Our trust in the Lord is what ought to set us apart from the rest of the world. Now, the people that we've been talking about in Hebrews chapter 11, the ones we'll actually mention today, they are just like us in that they were not perfect people. But they all are held up as examples of faith from whom we ought to learn their faith we ought to emulate. They serve as examples of what it means to live faithfully, to live believing God, to live trusting in the Lord and his promises. And at the end of the day, they didn't throw away their confidence in God. They may have wavered here and there just like we do, but they didn't throw it all away. They did the will of God and they received what was promised. And we all need to remember that as we read this this morning, this is not just a summary of Old Testament history. It's a part of every Christian story. It's part of your story. It's part of my story. These are not merely Israel's heroes of the faith. They are our heroes, too. They're part of our family. So if you have your Bible, look at Hebrews chapter 11. I'm going to read first from verse 17 down to 22. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each one of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of the staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. So we have here mentioned Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. They all looked forward to the promise of God. And they did not look back. And if there's anything we need to take this morning, don't look backwards. Keep moving forwards with what God wants to do in your life and what God wants to do in the life of us as a congregation. Isaac was the son through whom God would fulfill his promise to Abraham. He told Abraham, you're going to have a son. He actually told him what he's going to name him too. Isaac laughed at him. But the building up of the nation would take place not through Isaac alone. It would take place through Jacob and Jacob's sons and, and their children and their children and so on. And then Isaac takes the promise of Abraham. He hears it from his father and he passes it on to his sons, Jacob and Esau. And they pass it on to their sons. And it keeps getting passed on. Isaac trusted in God's promise that through Abraham's heir, his children would one day become a great nation and one day enter into the land of promise and be as numerous as the stars in the sky. Now, Isaac looked to the future. He believed God would fulfill his promise. And just like his father, Jacob did the same thing. Jacob looked forward. He trusted God to keep his promise. And even as he was close to get death, as it's pointed out here, he took his sons and he blessed his sons and anticipated what God would do in the future. And if you're taking notes, just jot down Genesis 49, where you see those blessings on those sons. Jacob's faith was future-oriented. It wasn't just in the now. 
He wasn't just constantly thinking about what happened years ago. He was looking forward. And he was fixed on God's faithfulness. Joseph also, his son, looked forward in faith and trusted that God would redeem the people from Egypt. Long before the Exodus event, Joseph saw it and looked forward to the time when they would come out of Egypt. If you're taking notes, Genesis 50. For Joseph to look forward to the Exodus and then communicate that fact to his sons is almost as remarkable as Abraham saying to Sarah, we're going to have a son when he was 100 years old. Joseph demonstrated remarkable trust in God's plan, and he believed that God would not leave him. And not only that, but he wouldn't leave Israel in Egypt. And he wouldn't forsake them. And he wouldn't forsake his promises. That is faith. And that is the kind of faith that we all need to have. Then the, the story continues here as the writer is recounting these people of faith. Verses 23 through 28 he brings up Moses. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. So we have Moses and the whole Exodus event recounted here for us. And we, we notice right off the bat that faith, Moses' faith, was fixed on the work of God. And it wasn't just because God did things. It wasn't just because God could act and God can make a way like, we, like I was saying a while ago. The trust was in the absolute worth of God, too. God is worthy. God is worthy to be trusted. When the writer says that Moses was hidden... Because he was beautiful. That's kind of a strange statement, right? What does that mean? He's not saying that Moses was hidden because he was just a cute baby. Yeah. There's lots of cute babies, right? Anybody ever show you an ugly baby? Just kidding. Moses' beauty. What is it about? It's because his parents, who are also, by the way, people of faith, saw the value of that child. And knew that somehow God was going to make a way. And God was going to fulfill a promise. And God was going to take this child and fulfill a particular destiny. Moses was a beautiful child because he was set apart for a specific task by God. And that task was leading Israel out of the land of slavery. Out of Egypt and into the promised land. And so he says here, his parents were not afraid to disobey the king's command. What did the king say? He says, you're to take every male child born to the Hebrews and throw them into the Nile. That's not just murder. It is murder. But they're also at the same time offering these children as sacrifices to the God of the Nile. And yet Moses' parents said, no way. I'm not going to do that. And so they hid him, and then when they couldn't hide him anymore, they put him in the river in a basket that would float, praying that someone would find him. And they actually sent Miriam, the sister, to see what happens. And you know the rest of the story. Pharaoh's daughter found Moses and, and took him into the palace and raised him as her own son. And in verse 24, the spotlight shifts away from the faith of Moses' parents to Moses' own faith. Moses had a choice at this point. He could choose comfort. He could choose wealth. He could choose everything that could possibly be in his reach. Or he could choose persecution. And what did he choose? He chose to be identified with the Israelites. Why? 
Why would he give up all that stuff that the world offers so that he can be punished and ultimately driven out of Egypt? Why? Because he knew the promise of God. He knew what God had promised his people. And he could either be one who was faithless or he could be one who was full of faith. And he chose to be full of faith. He aligned himself with Israel because he trusted the Lord. He knew that Egypt was not his home. Just like we all, we all ought to understand that this world is not our home. We're bound for a greater country. And Moses recognized the vanity of Pharaoh's house. And, and, and all the all-surpassing worth of God in his kingdom and the obedience to God, he recognized that. And so, yeah, he chose persecution. But that's not all he did. Verse 26 it raises an interesting question. What does Jesus Christ have to do with Moses' rejection of Egypt? Let's look at verse 26 again. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. How did Moses know Jesus? By faith. By faith in the promise from God. The storyline of Scripture rests squarely on the promise of a coming Messiah. The mistreatment of Moses ultimately pointed to what would be the mistreatment of Jesus. The very Messiah who would come to redeem his people. And Moses himself would later write that a later on a prophet is going to come. Like him, but greater. That would fulfill the promises of God. If you take a note to Deuteronomy 18. The covenant promises in which these Old Testament saints believe and all find their fulfillment, they all find their fulfillment in Jesus. He's the one that brings it all together. He's the one the whole Old Testament is about. In 2 Corinthians 1.20, Paul says, For all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. All the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. Moses was looking for the one who would redeem Israel. Moses endured reproach because he identified with the Israelites. He bore witness to and he foreshadowed the reproach that Christ would bear. By the way, as he identified with his own people, he would bear that reproach, that suffering, that shame. Moses chose persecution over fleeting pleasures because he acted in accordance with his faith in God's promises. And the reward for trusting in God rather than man is greater than anything and everything that this world could possibly offer us. Faith also trusts in what is unseen. And when we're told that in the very first sentence of chapter 11, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Moses had faith in what was unseen. Moses demonstrated his faith in God by leaving Egypt. Just like Joseph, Moses knew that Egypt was not his home. Egypt was not the promised land. He left because he believed God's promises to Israel. Verse 27 is a reminder of a very basic principle, and it's this. We must decide whose anger we're going to fear more. A leader's anger, the world's anger, or God? Who do you fear more? Moses chose to fear God more. He knew clearly that he is the Lord. He's sovereign over everything. And so Moses, because he feared God, did not fear Pharaoh. He did not fear the wrath of Pharaoh. He trusted God. He followed God. He trusted God to be faithful, so he acted on that faith. And he just moved forward with the plan that God had revealed to him. And then we see in the rest of the chapter, there's a whole list of names and events that come up. Verses 29 through 31. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land. But the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. 
By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been rich for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient, because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. Now, this is, this is extraordinary stuff here. Verse 29, a foretaste of the redemption that sinners would receive in Christ. And what is implicit in Exodus, the writer of Hebrews makes very explicit for us. It took faith in the trustworthiness of God to walk across a sea floor and to make it to the other side. The, the Egyptians, they didn't trust God. They didn't have faith in God. What was it that held the water back? It was God, of course, but it was God seeing to the fulfillment of his promise. That he would see his people back to the land that he promised. Verse 30 takes us to the city of Jericho. The battle that's recounted there in Joshua 6. By faith, the people obeyed the Lord's battle plan. On the surface of things, if you go back to, to Joshua 6 and look at what God told them to do, no military commander would even think of that. And God said, here's what I want you to do. Uh, oh, okay. We're going to march around the city once a day. We're going to do that for seven days. On the seventh day, we're going to march around the city seven times. And we're going to blow all the trumpets. Oh, okay. But they listened to God. They did it as ridiculous as it sounds. And when they blew the trumpets, what happened? The walls came tumbling down. That's right. By faith they obeyed. And then verse 31 talks about someone who we would probably not list in a list of people of faith. But yet here she is. Rahab the prostitute. Not a name that we would naturally expect here, but she's an awesome example of faith. She was motivated by her faith. What did she do? She hid the people from Israel that came to spy out the land. She, she decided, I don't have anything here. I have nothing in this world. I have nothing to trust in this life. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to go with God's people. I'm going to take care of these people for God. And she is rewarded for her faith. And she's listed here. And then following on from there, verse 32. And what more shall I say? It's like the writer of Hebrews. He's got all these things in his mind. He said, how can I possibly talk about all the examples of faith? In the Bible. So he mentions a few things here. What for time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy. Wandering about in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. What a statement. What a statement by the writer of Hebrews here, inspired by the Holy Spirit. These lives, and some of these people's lives, they were rascals, right? If you think about it. They had flawed lives, they were, but they were marked by remarkable faith. As I said at the very beginning, they didn't throw away their faith. Think about some of these people that were mentioned here. Gideon. Gideon, listed in the people of faith. This same Gideon who tested God said, God, would you please just give me a sign? And then when God finally said, he gave him a sign, he said, God, I, don't, I still don't believe you. Can you give me another sign? That Gideon, okay, 
The same Gideon who later on would lead the people of Israel into sin and worshiping an idol. Yeah, that Gideon. But guess what? None of those sins are brought up here. But his faith is. What about Samson? Good old Samson. Promiscuous. Broke his covenant with God. Yet in the end, he was a person of faith. He believed God in the end and trusted him. Jephthah, well, don't be a dad like Jephthah. Jephthah promised and vowed to sacrifice his own daughter. And yet here he is. His sin is remembered no more. His faith is remembered. David, David committed adultery. He had the, the Bathsheba's husband put to death, murdered on the front lines. He lied, tried to cover everything up. And yet David's sins aren't remembered here. But his faith is. Your sins, because you've been forgiven by Jesus Christ, will be remembered no more. But your faith will. And though all these people sin, their lives were ultimately marked by their faith in God. The question is, are our lives going to be marked the same way? And we're probably not called to die like these, some of these people did, especially the later verses here. We could be. The question is, are we going to be the same kind of people who trusted God like they did? Even if it means dying for your faith. Justin Martyr, he was one of the early church fathers. And like many Christians during that time period, suffered persecution. And it came to the point where he, being a leader of the church, and his whole congregation was appointed on a day to go to the place of execution. And as they went to that place and he beheld it, he saw it, he pointed out to the rest of his congregation and look, brothers and sisters, they can kill us, but they can't hurt us. And they went to their death, which was really entering into their life. Jesus made a, a way for Moses and he can make a way for you too. Will you commit yourself to Christ? And in your commitment to Christ, how are you going to show that commitment? What are you going to do about it? So it's not just enough just to say, I have faith. What are you going to do about it? Let's pray. Father, we are humbled this morning. We thank you for these examples of people that have gone before us that, yes, are, are part of our own family because of faith. We thank you for telling us the truth. We thank you for sending a Redeemer to us, your only son. Thank you for your great, great love. Your son's name, Jesus, is the most beautiful name in all the world. He's a reason why we're here. He's a reason why we exist. He has changed everything about us, whether we realize it yet or not. That's, that's in, the, in the process. Father, may your spirit lead us on from this place not just to say here in a group of, of like believers that, yeah, we, we believe and we love Jesus and we, we're people of faith, but we actually go outside of these walls and do the same thing. Lord, help us to do that faithfully. In the name of Christ, amen. amen.